We now yeah. know ivermectin would have cured COVID in, in very ill people. Yeah. It's been a number of studies which are positive, yet Fauci went on and lied and said it was toxic and dangerous horse only. And I think that probably led to hundreds of thousands of deaths mm. because everybody I've talked to who used it, nobody has had a death from it. Mm. And I myself used it on two patients who were really, really ill after they'd had everything else but didn't want to go to hospital uh, and they responded to it. So I, I know from personal experience it, it works. So the saying government wouldn't let you have that, that won't let you have this. So why won't they let you have things that we know are very simple, safe and effective. I mean, ivermectin is unbelievably uh, low toxicity. It's one of the world's safest drugs, isn't it, really? It's It's safer safer than ibuprofen or paracetamol or acetaminophen. Far, far far safer. I mean, it's given to millions of people around the world and saves the lives, not only lives, but the eyesight. It's Mm. it's said to uh, save two million people a year from going blind Mm. from the filaria. Yeah. And yet has antiviral properties. And uh, should, should we mention now potential anti-cancer properties? Seeing we're talking about well, I think that the fact that there's been publications on it. I mean, I, I've I recently reviewed an enormous one uh, looking at how it could be an anti-cancer agent, and even I was getting a little bit tired uh, because there were so mecha- many mechanisms it could actually give you some anti-cancer activity. This is this is see, uh, something that I'm very familiar with because I did a lot of work with thalidomide mm. and celgene, developing lenalidomide and pomalidomide, which you know I'm, that's why I'm really delighted to say because I was a big company behind that we got those on the market but if it was a small company they would probably just have been pushed away but lenalidomide is number one uh, uh, for myeloma now even on the nhs i mean Mm. it's been number one use worldwide for several years but Mm. even the nhs means it's first line yeah. Uh, treatment uh, for myeloma it's made an incredible difference the reason i mention this with ivermectin is that we couldn't believe how many pathways lenalidomide interfered with mm, mm. and to the point where the company who was funding us to do all this basic research said stop doing it you're finding too many ways it it uh, interferes with things and the regulatory authorities don't like that <laughs> it is <laughs> it's quite, own conclusion it's quite, at any rate strange, lenalidomide and ivermectin have tremendous similarities and they hit so many pathways, which mm. I believe is why they uh, both of these drugs can be administered at non-toxic doses with significant anti-cancer activity. And that is an absolute fact established with lenalidomide because uh, it's, it's been approved for myeloma and lymphoma worldwide, over 200 countries. So an absolute mm. fact. I strongly suspect ivermectin would uh, uh, pa- pass all those tests too. Mm-hmm. And as well as that, they, these can be used as well as conventional approaches to cancer treatment. This is as well as radiotherapy, potentially, as well as chemotherapy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It, the, the, it, when you're talking about using these drugs, uh, even though they actually work well by themselves, mm. you're actually making it more likely they will respond to, to other treatments because you're patching up the sieves that the other... Yeah drugs don't deal with you know yeah. they, they they get rid of 80 percent of the cancer mm. and then it starts uh dividing again and goes through the holes that the chemo will never never reach so yeah. that, that's why i think it's so important to add all this in at the same mm. time and then because there's zero toxicity these drugs as lenalidomide has shown you can give that for years right. and the fantastic thing about that is when you get resistant to it eventually, sometimes five years, you can add in the pomalidomide, which is so similar, and it will take over and gain control of the cancer. I mean, to us, this is just un- unthinkable of how the mechanisms are, but it happens, and it's mm. happened in, in several uh, anti-cancer drugs now where there's sequential changes to the, the, the index drug. Just because it sounds too good to be true doesn't mean it's not true by any means. Exactly. So, so are these new versions of thalidomide now uh, non-teratogenic? 
that's very interesting. They, they that this was the reason they they wouldn't uh, let us uh, do this for a little bit. Yeah. I, I applied to the MRC and the Wellcome Trust and the CRC UK, whatever it was at the time. They all turned down because of my application, because I had actually seen patients benefit so dramatically on thalidomide. Mm. I said, we mustn't chuck the baby away with the bathwater. Mm. They all turned round, down my grants on the grounds that we cannot get involved with this. It causes birth defects. Mm. And I said, look, I'm an oncologist. Every drug I use causes birth defects. Yeah, it's not it stupid enough to give them yeah, yeah. to pregnant women. And it's yeah. very easy to do that too. Because of its uh, origin, uh, the lenalidomide is very similar to thalidomide. It has the same limitations, but it's not a bad limitation. Mm. It's an oral drug you take every day for a month. So you just can't get more than one month without a negative pregnancy test if you're a woman or a man who's breeding too. I mean, it's just, it's just the way they do it. Mm. Um, but interestingly, the, in, in practice, we know lenalidomide has, doesn't have that birth defect, mm. uh, but we just have to pretend that it does, but it doesn't. Yeah. It's reasonable to be cautious about it. Yeah, isn't it? that's that's a reasonable precaution, yeah. as opposed to the, the, many of the others that have been mm -hmm. taken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so g going back to the, the the vaccines that you, you and others have developed here. Have you got a company that's up and running and saying, yeah, we can make these for you now, Gus? Oh, Imodulin is the company. Imodulin is the company making the IMM 101. And they're ready and to go. It's, and if, there's, a, there's a chart there. This is one we published in 2016. It is a very simple, multi-center, randomized uh, yeah. trial in which the standard treatment at the time for pancreatic cancer was gemcitabine. So all we did was randomize to IMM or a placebo, um, and in fact, not all the places use placebo because it's obvious if you have a little in intradermal injection. Yeah. And this is what you're looking at is survival. I mean, it is unbelievably effective uh, survival because at the time we used gemcitabine, it was, uh, it was only used for patients who weren't fit enough for the new more toxic regimens that come in so that the survival is even more important because the the standard patient we treated was so poorly and yet we had this fantastic improvement if you gave imm and gem the survival was far superior to gemcitabine alone mm. i'd just like to add though the one other thing that uh, i can never ever um tire of saying is that when I was asked why this immunotherapy worked so well by a guy in, in, uh, in America when we presented it, he said, why does none of the other immunotherapies work in pancreatic cancer? And I said, well, this is probably the first trial where we insisted that the vitamin D levels had to get into the normal range. He subsequently, he couldn't believe this. He said, I've never heard of this, and I'm a very big pancreatic trial cancer person. His name was Daniel Von Hoff. And he was quite, uh, he was huffing and puffing about this. <laughs> but he phoned me three months later to say he'd put somebody on a study to check. He'd done 4,000 patients on different trials over, over two to three decades. And he came back and he said not a single patient responded to a single chemotherapy agent if they had a low vitamin D level. He was absolutely knocked out. And the really good ones that they put down to the later agents as they came along in the trials, that the responses were purely correlated with the fact these rare patients had high vitamin D levels. So, mm -hmm. this, And so the, with this, it's one of the things I've always said, we're going to stimulate the innate immune system, you must have a good vitamin D level first. Which makes perfect sense because you've got vitamin D receptors in every type of white blood cell. Mm. You've got vitamin D genomic expression that depends on, uh, mm. vitamin D dependent genomic expression in mm. every type of white blood cell. Mm. It, it, seems, it seems fairly obvious. Interestingly though, that the patients with the high levels of vitamin D in the blood, did they actually do better? Was there like a dose response there? Yes, yes there was. He confirmed that. He said he couldn't believe it. I mean, he spent yeah. 30 years doing this and hadn't uh, uh, realised it was that simple. Well, I, I must confess that we took a while before we realised that the difference between a responder and a non-responder was the vitamin D. We looked at virtually everything else and we only 
cottoned on to vitamin D yeah. when we were able to use the hospital's vitamin D testing service that they use for mothers and babies relative to rickets. And as soon as we could do it for adults, we found that it was it was the same. The only people who responded really well to the, the vaccines, including the immune modulators like IMM, were the people who had a good healthy vitamin D levels. Mm. It also highlighted that the NHS's idea of a normal vitamin D is really too low. At, le- le- at least in this pathological situation. It's in a pathological low. situation. Yeah. Because vitamin D is too low in the general population. Because mm. this is a population that spe- is uh, very white-skinned uh, and uh, exists in indoors most of the time so it yeah. doesn't get a chance yeah. and then people who have got darker skins it is far far worse, far worse. so they need definitely need supplementation mm. it's interesting so for years you'd known that some patients respond to your chemotherapeutic regimes and some don't and the reason that the non-responders didn't respond is because they were low on vitamin d it was that simple yeah, yeah. it is and that simple that's so obvious once you know but <laughs> Mm. So what sort of levels do you like to titrate up to for chemotherapy? Uh, over, I like to get it over 100 nanomoles per litre. Yeah. Uh, the NHS normal is 50 nanomoles per litre, so yeah. it's, it's, it's far too low. Yeah, so over 100. Mm. But that's still only about sort of 35, 40 nanograms per mil, isn't it? It's not. Yeah. And, you know, the upper limit of normal is usually 200 to 220, so it's nowhere mm. near toxic. No. Absolutely no, Bernier. And even then, in, in your career, have you seen a case of vitamin D-induced hypercalcemia? I, it's it's very difficult to say. In my a direct question is no, but I have heard of it occurring in children where the mothers are given ludicrous high doses. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the kidneys can't take it. Right, uh, right, you, right. You've got to be very careful giving vitamin D supplementation in renal failure. Right. And certain people with uh, rare uh, phosphate genetic pathway abnormalities. Mm-hmm. Apart from that, uh, you, you normally just uh, pee it out if yeah. any excess. You have a, uh, a thermostat. And once the vitamin D goes up, I mean, there's some people you can give grams too nearly and they'll never go above 120 interesting uh, just, so even, even though it's a fat soluble vitamin because traditionally i would teach that it's water soluble vitamins that are urine excreted mm. but here we have a fat soluble vitamin that's actually urine excreted you can test the urine and find high levels of mm. vitamin d in the urine mm. if, if you give if you give large amounts it's mm. just um yeah it just seems complete no brainer not to do that um, is this done now in cancer centers around the country is, is vitamin d replete it's sl- slowly but I just cannot believe the number of people I get uh, referred for second opinion. You know, will you please see this person? Uh, they've been on all the right treatment. They're not responding. Have you got any sort of magic, this, that and the other? And I find they've never had their vitamin D measured from, you know, big cancer centres, which I won't name. <laughs> but And I measure the vitamin D and it's really low. And so I, that's the first thing I do, boost it up. And I thought, that should not be my job. No, <laughs> it should. The 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 uh, the, the, junior, the, the should, should get sorry. to a professor to do that. The junior should do that. Well, exactly. Anyone comes near me should have a very good vitamin D level. It's not my yeah. job to point <laughs> yeah. out you've just had uh, a year of treatment. It's a total waste of time because you've got a low vitamin D level. It's yeah. unbelievable. And, and the human suffering and the financial cost yeah. involved in yeah. that is just unbelievable. Yeah. But even hospitals with. Uh, very good reputations mm. are, are not getting vitamin D measured in a lot of their patients. Yeah, incredible. In fact, the, the, the people who do push for it are actually the dietitians. Yes. Not the doctors, not the oncologists. Yeah. Yeah. The oncologists will say, well, there's no good evidence. Of course there's good evidence. They just <laughs> yeah. never, never, ever bother to do the research on it. Mm. Mm. So two very natural things, the IMN, which is, 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 is the mycobacterium, attenuated mm. bacterial preparation, the vitamin D, perfectly mm. natural, mm. And, and, and getting those two things right has got this massive benefit. 